welcome everyone to our first uh, uh, IPMP seminar this semester. And today we are happy to have uh, Xian Zhao, and he will speak about QFT in ADS instead of LSZ. So please, you are welcome to start. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the invitation for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, my work together with um, Dr. Komatsu, Miguel Paulos, and uh, my advisor, Baltimore Reese. So let me first give a brief outline of the talk. So for the first part, I will try to give a brief introduction and motivation on this framework of taking the fast pace limit. And then I will go on to give a more detailed uh, setup and prescription on how to uh, actually extract the S matrix. I will also provide some perturbative examples. And in the last part, uh, I will try to give a non perturbative formulation of our prescription. So first, let me say a few words about um, why which we should be interested in the analysis, uh, the analysis of S matrix. So knowing it can give us many useful results. Uh, for example, the most famous one perhaps is that we can write down dispersion arrangements for the scattering amplitude. Uh, this basic starts from the Cauchy theorem. You can write down your scattering amplitude as a contour integral around, around some pole. And by knowing the analyticity, you can now deform the contour and blow up to the infinity. Uh, in simplest form, without any subtractions, uh, this is a uh, dispersion relation we can write down, which can reconstruct the full amplitude by just the knowledge of its discontinuity along the branch cuts. A second uh, application uh, is to put bounds on the scattering amplitude or the total cross section. And the Fossa Matan bound may be the most famous one, which says that the total scattering uh, cross section is bounded by some constant times log square of S. And uh, to derive this Fossa Matan bound, we need three uh, important inputs. The first is the unitarity, um, and the second is analyticity in the complex S plane with some fixed but slightly positive T. So we need to have an authenticity in some uh, non-physical region that is slightly above the physical region. And the third thing that we need is a polynomial boundedness of the scattering amplitude in large S. So all these are related combined to derive this bound. And one can see that the analyticity of S matrix is an important uh, input. Uh, thirdly, another application of S-metric analyticity is a uh, recently revived program, which is called the S-matrix bootstrap. And the main idea of this program is to carve out the space of uh, S-matrices that is really allowed, or in other words, that is consistent with, for example, analyticity, unitarity, and crossing symmetry. And this work... Uh, works in this direction were revived recently, uh, starting from the paper in 2016. And here there is a nice review paper by these uh, three authors. And I will only give one uh, example to illustrate um, the connection between analyticity and this numerical bootstrap program. So here uh, we can, uh, the observable we want to put bound on is the so-called quartic coupling in four space-time dimension, it's called G0, and it's uh, proportional up to a constant factor to the scattered amplitude evaluated uh, at the crossing symmetric point. Um, then here, the plot has two uh, color schemes. The green one tells you, uh, covers the region where the G0 is allowed to take. And to obtain this green plot, uh, one key input is about the analysis of S matrix. And the assumption or the input is the assumption of uh, the Mandelstam analyticity or the so-called maximal analyticity, which says that uh, for any fixed T, uh, if you have scattering of the lightest particle, then the only singularity on your complex S plane are the branch cuts. Or if there's some bound states, and then you have some poles, and that's all you have. And this is true for any complex uh, value of t, and vice versa if you swap s and t. So this 
Now, statement is quite strong and has never been rigorously proved. And then uh, the other part of the plot uh, are the red uh, plots. And this plot are uh, disallowed region of the parameter G0. So whatever is covered by red uh, are excluded, which are not consistent with unitarity and physicality and so on. Uh, another main difference between the red plot and the green uh, plot is that the analyticity assumed here or input here are the ones that have been rigorously proved, which has a smaller region of analyticity compared to uh, the input for the green part. So if you look at far away, is, these two uh, results seem to agree, but if you zoom in, uh, you can see that there's still a finite gap between the two approaches. And both numerics have converged. So although it's small, but it's a finite difference between the two uh, methods. So this is an um, illustration of um, the role of uh, the input that's quite important in this asymmetric bootstrap program. Just on the lower part, there's a... Sorry, uh, you are talking about scalar matrix, uh, right? Just scattering of scalars or what? Uh, yes, only scalars. And the identical scalars. How you define coupling, quartic coupling? What does it mean? What's G0? How is it defined? G0. It's yeah. defined like this. Well, right? It's it's the value it's of not... the amplitude. Yeah. Value yeah. of your amplitude it's... particular values of momentum right? of STU, right? Uh, yes, S and TU are all equal to uh, 4m squared over 3. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's scattering of the same mass particles. Yes, the same massive particle. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, what particles can be exchanged, like uh, on the internal lines? Only one scalar mm -hmm. or everything like uh, is allowed? Uh, I think uh, in this case, they're assuming uh, they're scattering the lightest particle and they don't say anything much about uh, the possible exchange particles. The only thing is that you have a branch card starting from 4m squared and you impose unitarity along the branch cut. But you don't necessarily know uh, what's the next branch cut. Does it start from 3m, 9m squared or 16m squared or some other values? Uh, that's not something as an input into this bootstrap program. Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK. Um, the lower part of plot uh, is similar, but I think it's less interesting in the sense that uh, the the allowed bootstrap program has not uh, fully converged, so you see a larger gap. So the next question uh, we would like to address is how to study the asymmetric anarchistic. And there are several approaches. Uh, the first, or perhaps the most uh, familiar one, is to start from axiomatic, axiomatic QFT. And uh, based on this approach, uh, two of the most famous results, perhaps, are uh, related to 2 to 2 scattering. The first is about elastic 2 to 2 scattering, namely the incoming and outgoing particles are the same, and they are also the lightest. And in this case, the anthicity uh, people can, especially my time, can prove rigorously is that uh, on the complex S plane, uh, the only singularities are the branch cuts uh, from S channel and U channel. And T can range from minus eight, 28 M squared to 4 M squared. Uh, in his result or in his paper, T can also take up some complex values. But this complex region on complex, uh, this region on complex T plane intersect with the real axis uh, on minus 28 m square and 4 m square. And this is the anathlicity assumption that was input uh, put in to the red bootstrap I was showing uh, in the last slide. And for general 2 to scattering, uh, we know less. Uh, the result is uh, by Ross Epstein and Garza in the same year. And uh, they said, or they, what they found or they proved is that about from two branch cuts, uh, there's a region of unknown anathlicity uh, near the center of S plane. And the size of this uh, potato-shaped region 
uh, is controlled or is related to the, num uh, the value of t that is fixed. In general, the larger the t is, uh, the larger this region of unknown entity. And uh, very little is known about uh, higher point scattering uh, from this approach. Uh, the second uh, method that one can use uh, is perturbative analysis. For example, for example, one can write down the lambda equations and draw the lambda diagrams and to analyze uh, the singularities of the denominator in your final integral. And this gives you necessary conditions on uh, having singularity for a particular uh, Feynman diagram. And finally, uh, the third approach, which will be the focus of this talk, is to uh, do something very different. We want to put conformal field theory, sorry, quantum field theory in anti-decider space, and then take the fast space limit. And uh, taking the fast space limit is not a new idea. It started basically uh, almost immediately after the appearance of ADS-CFT conjecture. So uh, the, the earliest paper that I know of are in 1999 from uh, Bochinsky and Suskin. And back then it was mostly uh, focused on massive particle scattering in the fast space. And the approach or the program to focus on gapped QFT in ADS without gravity started from 2016. And then there have been many papers uh, along this direction. So um, the idea of this flat space limit is that we want to replace the LSA axioms, uh, which most of the known results uh, rely on, uh, which is also captured uh, compactly by the LSA reduction formula. We want to replace them by CFT axioms plus the setup of putting QFT in ADS. And then we want to define the S matrix as the limit of a sequence of conformal correlation functions uh, that is labeled by R. And then sending R to infinity, uh, we should get uh, the S matrix. I will be more precise about this uh, Getschi definition very quickly. And uh, the advantage of doing so is that uh, it allows us to borrow the power of conformal symmetry a version OPE and state of operator correspondence and more, for example, unitarity. It also lets us to um, start with a sequence of well understood analytic functions rather than some distributions. Uh, by distributions, I mean this time ordered correlation function. In fact, starting from Whiteman axioms, sorry, starting from Whiteman axioms, uh, I don't think it's possible or it's done to prove that this time ordered. Uh, is a distribution. So in the LSA axioms, uh, it is assumed by axiom that this is a distribution. And then people can move on to extract the S matrix and prove analysis results. Uh, may I ask a somewhat maybe sideways question? Um, so you look at some QFT, massive QFT, and ask for its, its matrix. But what about its ultraviolet behavior? So it you are assuming there is some uh, cutoff building or ultraviolet, it should be ultraviolet complete or what What are the assumptions? Because if you have ultraviolet divergences, your CFT at the boundary will also be defined on the model uh, the unknown constants, which you need to fix or, yeah. So the question is about, uh, yeah, right. what is freedom? Uh, let me try to answer your question. Um, first of all, um, we can only answer this within the framework of quantum field theory rather than, rather than involving uh, gravity. And then you, you are basically asking what's the high energy limit of your scattering amplitude. And uh, for example, then you can ask uh, what's the range limit or, yeah. So you can, you can ask in a very concrete setup, what's the limit when you send S to infinity while keeping T fixed or keeping the scattering angle fixed? Um, if you allow me to reformulate the question this way, um, then this is related to some limit of my conformal correlation function. And these limits, are some of them are well understood. Some of them are not uh, fully understood yet. 
Uh, so depending on our knowledge on the CFD side, uh, we can say uh, something about the high energy limit. For example, we can show that the scatter amplitude that we consider uh, has a polynomial bound. It's, it's, yes, it's polynomial bounded this way. So it looks like, and, so you are kind of assuming the theory, your theory you are considering is in some sense is well behaved in ultraviolet. Well, the idea would be like something like QCD or gauge theory, which is asymptotically free and there is a mass generation. So you have non perturbative mass, which is your parameter. And then the amplitude depends on that mass and uh, STU and that's the setup, I think. But if you look at something like QED, that will not go like that. Yes. Um... Uh, I see your point. Uh, I think uh, apart from what I uh, said, we don't have um, more to say about this uh, ultraviolet uh, diver divergence or non-divergences uh, at the moment, because uh, what we have worked out is a very simple uh, toy model with only scalars. Um, let me think. Yeah, I think um, I don't have anything better to say than what I just said. Okay, well, thank you. So, so basically, for five four theory, if you think of five four theory, you wouldn't be able. It will not be in the class of theories you want to consider, because uh, it's effectively free theory if we remove the cutoff. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, could you yeah, please also you. clarify what do you mean by uh, whether something is distribution or not a distribution? Do you mean something like I have some prescriptions or pre presence of delta functions? Or what exactly do you mean? So, okay, uh, roughly speaking, is that if you expand your time ordered uh, correlation function as a bunch of th heavy side theta function times Whiteman uh, functions. Uh, just by knowing that what the functions are distributions, uh, as far as I know, it's not easy, or I don't think it's even done, to prove that this time-ordered uh, coercion function is a distribution. Mm. Okay, so but so this is invariant signature, right? Otherwise, uh, yes, time ordering. And Lorenzen, in yeah, theory, yeah. case are going to be in Lorenz or, or in Euclidean signature? In, in the ADS case, uh, the S matrix we finally extract uh, is in Lorenzen. But on the CFT side, it's more complicated. That I will explain. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So uh, the two main questions we want to answer is uh, the following. What's the fate of the conformal correlators, the limit that we are going to take? And then after taking the limit, how do we extract the S matrix? So uh, before, to, before moving on to show you the prescription, let me very quickly and briefly uh, explain some preliminary uh, setup. The first is about ADS space. There are very various ways to parameterize ADS space. Uh, in this case, Euclidean ADS space. Uh, the, two, the two coordinates that we are going to use uh, are the so-called spherical coordinates where you parameterize by a radial parameter rho and angles in uh, D dimensions, which is uh, shown here as a plot, as a sketch. And if you take, if you send uh, ADS curvature radius R to infinity, you can easily recover the flat space uh, metric. Another one is the so-called global coordinates in which the ADS space is conformal to a solid cylinder. And now tau is the global time and lambda is the radial direction. And then you have the rest uh, angular uh, variables. And we are going to denote uh, bulk points as capital X which, had, which is parameterized by rho, the radial uh, direction, and a unit vector. And then boundary points will be noted by a P, which is uh, just a unit vector living on a sphere. 
and similarly for uh, the uh, global coordinates. The next uh, concept is the so-called Witten diagram. Witten diagram is just a Feynman diagram in ADS space and with external points pushed uh, to the conformal boundary at infinity. Like the usual Feynman diagrams, they have two basic ingredients. Uh, they are bulk bulk propagators and also bulk to boundary propagators. Uh, one thing that might be worth uh, saying is that the bulk bulk propagator satisfy this uh, Laplace or Poisson equation, and then plus the boundary condition that when you send x and y uh, distance between them to infinity, uh, the correlator should die off. So it has some exponential decay uh, as x and y uh, distance between x and y goes to infinity. And then, so if you want to extract uh, the bulk to boundary propagator from the bulk bulk propagator, you need to multiply some compensating exponentially growing factor such that uh, the result of this limit is finite. So uh, now our uh, setup uh, and the main idea is the following. We will consider gapped QFT in fixed Euclidean ADS space in D plus one dimension. And by fixed, I mean, there's no gravity. Uh, that's just a setup because we want to consider uh, only scattering amplitude without uh, interaction with uh, with uh, gravity. And then the curvature radius is uh, defined, uh, denoted by R. So for the bulk field phi with mass M, it corresponds to a boundary correlator O with scaling dimension, scaling dimension delta. And they satisfy the usual relation that delta times delta minus D equals M squared R squared. Assuming uh, that we have ADS isometry, then the boundary correlators are constrained by the conformal group in uh, D plus one, in D dimension, sorry. Um, and then they obey all the usual uh, D dimensional CFT axioms. Then uh, we will take the fast space limit, which is defined as sending both delta and uh, uh, curvature radius R to infinity while holding their ratio fixed. And in this limit, this fixed ratio is nothing but the mass of the scalar field uh, in the bulk. So the idea is that we hope to uh, calculate conformal correlator, which is also, we want to take the conformal correlator, which can also be calculated by Wooten diagrams, and then take the limit. And we want to see how much of analyticity, unitarity, and boundedness, and so on from the CFD side can be transferred into uh, the fast space side. Um, may I ask you another question? <clears throat> yes, please. Um, so uh, you are saying your CFT obeys usual axioms, but uh, will it be complete? I mean, uh, what you have in the EDS, you just have one, say, scalar field, which will be due to one particular operator. How do you know which CFT at the boundary you're talking about? Or you just talk about one particular correlate in that CFT, but then... Um, yeah, so what are the what are the rules of the game? That's my question. So it's one thing if you think you have complete theory in ADS due to some CFT at the boundary, which is also complete in the sense of a B, and you have all operators dual to all states, all fields in the bulk, etc. Another thing, if you just take one particular field in ADS due to a particular operator at the boundary. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm confused about what, what should be the rules of the game in this case. Yes, okay. The setup I just said is, uh, is just uh, quite specified for the example we are going to consider, but a more general setup is that um, we want to define the QFT in ADS by the CFT on the boundary. And to define a CFT, which, um, Without considering defects and bound uh, and boundary CFTs, like only a CFT in in the fast space, uh, it, it's defined by the CFT data, namely the spectrum, the OP spectrum, the scaling dimensions, and the OP coefficients. So, in other words, we can uh, define the CFT by a set of correlation functions. Well, it does not just involve uh, the particular uh, four point function that I've written down here. There are many, many other operators that we haven't specified. 
Okay, so the, your, your starting point is really CFT, and then you look at particular object in that CFT and try to relate it to this QFT amplitude in ADS, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, to be more precise, we don't consider a single CFT. It's more like a family of CFTs because we are sending all the scaling dimension to infinity. So you can think of uh, for any fixed set of scaling dimensions, it's one CFT. And then we increase the scaling dimensions uh, all the way to infinity. So it's a family of CFT that's uh, parameterized by scaling dimensions. So uh, By the way, can now let's be done. Probably it's a bit non-trivial that you can deform a CFT with like keeping all constraints satisfied and deform it like that. Um, of course, I don't know of uh, many examples like this because if you start from a conventional CFT point of view, you would like to first have the conform manifold, and uh, uh, it's not that easy to find a conform manifold that is suitable for our uh, purpose. But uh, what we mean is that, uh, or any scaling dimension delta along the limit, you can always define a set of correlation functions that obey all these CFT axioms. Whether they are physical, realistic CFTs, uh, that's not something we are assuming. The game or the, the aim is to make use of the CFT axioms and conversion OPE and state operator correspondence. Uh, if you allow these uh, properties as a axiomatic starting point, then our setup uh, works. Well, I mean, let's say consider an example of a de-icing model, then it's just like a single point in the space of CFTs. But uh, for this mm -hmm. thing to work, you need uh, some, to be able to deform it, right? Along the line of uh, different deltas. Yes, uh, for Ising model, it's, uh, well, from the numerical bootstrap results, we know that the scaling dimension is very uh, specif specific. It's There's an island on the, uh, let's say, delta and the delta, the scaling dimension, a uh, two-dimensional plot. It's not like you can freely move your delta, scaling dimension delta to some other value without preserving all the conformal consistent conditions. But that, I th think, has something to do with, um, the presence of the stress tensor. That's a very important input in the uh, ASYNC bootstrap program. Whereas here, we don't have such a uh, stress tensor on the boundary because if that would correspond to gravity in the block. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, the CFT side, you, have, you can have many uh, function nodes that yeah, you can use to bootstrap the CFT to put bounds on uh, your CFT side. And for scalars, the function that they have, they have found uh, has the constraint that the uh, twist gap in every spin channel, suppose you have 5 phi OPE, apart from the identity operator, the next uh, lightest uh, scaling dimension, by which I mean this twist gap because the scaling dimension minus uh, spin is the twist, and this gap cannot be higher than two delta phi. Uh, that's the only uh, constraint that you can have from the CFT bootstrap program. But if you say two delta phi is very heavy, then this twist gap can also be very large. So whatever we are assuming is compatible with all the um, bootstrap bounds that people have found. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks for the question. Um, oh, I see if already spent 28 minutes. Uh, okay, uh, let me speed up. So the well, main contraction of the main time. mass. You can take a bit more time since we have many questions. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, yes. So the main formula we uh, want to put out, let's say they're one of the two main formula, we have two. This is the first one, is to tell us how to extract the S matrix. So it says that to extract the flat space S matrix in D plus one dimension between A incoming and B outgoing particles is to put a A plus B point uh, conformal correlation function on the sphere B 
because these are unit norm vectors. And then analytic continue it to the so-called S matrix configuration. And I will come back to this expression very soon. After the continuation, we take the limit uh, by sending R to infinity and also all the scaling dimension delta to infinity, as I explained on the last slide. You keep the ratio between delta or the ratio between delta and R fixed. And this ratio is the mass. So, uh, and then you also should uh, prescribe the connection between these uh, positions and this momenta. And they are related in the following way. Uh, in the Euclidean CFT side, before doing this continuation, they are related uh, in this way that the unit norm vector on the sphere gives you the direction of your onshore momenta. And they have the same uh, number of degrees of freedom. And then uh, the mass of this onshore momenta is uh, then identified or related to the scaling dimension of this operator in this location. Now, coming back to the prescription of another continuation, uh, it says that you can split your union norm vector into two parts. One of the first, let's take the first one to be the space like, sorry, time like, and then the rest to be space like. And the time like part is identified with the energy uh, divided by M. And then the space like part is identified with an I factor times the spatial moment. In other words, if you want to extract a physical S matrix with physical momenta, uh, you should evaluate your conformal correlator on complex values uh, of your positions. So this is abstract. Before you uh, ask any question, let me go to the next slide to give a physical interpretation of this continuation. So this is the picture uh, that we are visualizing the continuation. Essentially, what we are doing is to take the Euclidean sphere that we started with uh, here and then split into half. So, and then we put a Lorentzian cylinder in the middle because in the end, the scattering process will be in the Lorentzian uh, signature. So imagine a two to two scattering process, uh, it will look like this. We insert two operator on the Euclidean boundary and then this will create a two particle state. And then these two particles will first follow the geodesic uh, and then tunnel through the Lorentzian cylinder and get ac accelerated by the ADS curvature. And then they will scatter near the center of ADS and then follow the inverse process and come out and then, then be detected on the other uh, boundary, the right-hand side Euclidean hemisphere. So one question uh, you may want to ask is, uh, since we are interested in the Lorentzian scattering process, why don't we just start from a Lorentzian CFT from the beginning? And the answer is that uh, time like uh, geodesics does not reach the boundary of Lorentzian ADS. By putting Euclidean cap on left hand and right hand side, um, this then now the particles can reach uh, the boundary. So it's a uh, nice and it's a uh, nice conceptual picture to have a well-defined uh, scattering process. So now let's test the prescription with some examples. The simplest one uh, one can think of is the two-point function uh, in CFT side. So if you take the two-point function and apply it to the prescription, uh, you first calculate it uh, and then it's a function of the distance between uh, N1 and N2. And since we are using new norm vectors, they can be parameterized by a cos of angle. And then you can do the energy continuation. What it does for you is to uh, replace the cos by a cosh. And this function is simple, but it's also very interesting because you can imagine on the uh, axis of theta one, two, when theta one, two is zero, uh, this two to the delta in the denominator cancels with the numerator and you are left with some uh, polynomial in R which goes to infinity when you send R to infinity. But slightly away from theta one to equal zero and exponential uh, decay kicks in. So now you can visualize this as a bump on the theta one two axis, which is very similar to uh, a, delta, a delta function 
And if you actually check the fast space limit of this against the usual uh, two point delta function in the fast space, you integrate both sides uh, along the moment of P2, for example, then you will find the same result. So indeed, uh, this two point function uh, applied with our prescription does give you the flat space uh, S matrix. And then a slightly uh, less trivial example is the four point contact diagram. If you take the Witten contact diagram and then apply the same procedure, you again find that it's equal to the flat space Feynman diagram, uh, the Feynman contact diagram which is nothing but the, con uh, the momentum conserving delta function of uh, all momenta that's involved. So with these two examples, now I can uh, introduce a slight variation of our previous uh, prescription, which is to extract uh, the scattering amplitude rather than the S matrix. So the idea is very simple. You take the connected part of the correlator and then you divide by the contact Witten diagram. And then you do the rest uh, as pre previously. And, recall, and the reason for this manipulation is easily seen by recalling that the S matrix can be written as this connected part of the uh, delta functions, plus a, an overall momentum conserving delta function times the scattering, scattering of T. What we are doing here is just to chop out this part and then divide out uh, the momentum conserving delta function to extract the T. The advantage of this uh, second prescription is that it's valid even in our physical regions. For example, if you want to uh, ex uh, explore the Mandelstam plane where S is complex, uh, then this friction can work. Whereas for the previous one, it's hard to make sense of a uh, direct delta function with complex moment. So the prescription we gave gives you a map uh, between bulk boundary, uh, sorry, between boundary position points and bulk momenta. And this can be translated to a map between cross ratios and the Mandelstam variance if you uh, focus on a two to two scattering process. And this map is particularly simple if we assume identical particles. And then uh, we can define the so-called conformal Mandelstam invariants, which are essentially, essentially cross ratios. They are just some recombination of the cross ratios on the CFP side, but we call them STU because they are identified with the usual uh, Mandelstam invariants in the flat space limit. So the exact expression is not very important and I would not bother you with them for now, but just to have an idea on how the analytic continuation works. Um, we can look at this conformal Mandelstam plane where the Euclidean triangle, this orange triangle in the middle is the region where we started from for the Euclidean conformal correlator. And then if you want to go to uh, the S physical region where our scattering process happens, we need to take our cross ratio uh, row uh, around zero by two pi. And then we can go from here to the S physical region. But more generally, you can explore the full region, I mean, uh, kinematically. And then you can ask various problem questions about S matrix analyticity in this uh, Mandelstam plane, including uh, complex S and complex T. Um Quick question. Uh, so there is a, a very often a discussion of this flat limit in terms of Millin uh, representation of the amplitude of the correlator. Is that yes, the in that space? Yeah. Is that what your picture, your definition of STU matches that one which appeared in Millin presentation? Yes, it does match. So. Um, in many space prescription, it tells you that the mapping variables gamma ij are related to uh, ki dot kj, where ki and kj are the fast space momenta. And uh, if you want, I can 
compute my conformal correlation function in position space as an integral over gamma ij uh, of the Malian amplitude. And then uh, if I do this Malian space integral by a set of point approximation, because I'm taking the flat base limit, uh, this gamma ij will be evaluated at a special point of the conformal cross ratio. So the set of point for the gamma ij relating to cross ratios can be further related to a uh, manual stem invariance. And this uh, indirect map that I just said agrees with the direct map to relate gamma ij with the uh, manual stem invariance. Uh, okay, thank you. Was that clear? Thank you, yes. Okay. Yes, actually in our paper, we also worked out the manual space uh, prescription and we, have, we found a very nice uh, agreement, but uh, I didn't include in this talk. If you're interested, uh, I can explain more. So next, uh, let me give a less trivial uh, example, which is quite interesting. Next, we want to study the scale exchange diagram. And this time we want to explore the full complex S-plane. So we will use the uh, amplitude conjecture. There is no disconnected part to cut out so we simply take the exchange diagram and divide by the contact diagram. And in the flat space limit, sometimes we find the expected results, namely a Feynman diagram with internal mass mu and external mass m. And the mu is related to this delta b. And b is for bound state. Uh, it doesn't have to be a bound state, it's just a name. And then m is related to delta that I forgot to label here. That's for one uh, situation, but for other situations, we find actually infinity by taking this limit. And more precisely, uh, this is the complex S-plane that we uh, explored and what we found. So um, let's focus on this uh, round shape region in the center. Within this uh, 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 circle, let's say, within this region, uh, we find infinity. And outside this region, we find the expected uh, Feynman diagram results. And here I have different colors, blue, uh, orange, green, and they correspond to different ratios between internal mass mu and external mass m. So 0 0.5 corresponds to this um, blue region, and then 1.85 corresponds to this red region uh, in the middle. So the largest possible region of divergence uh, is actually achieved by sending mu to zero. And then what we get is this uh, dashed circle, which is centered uh, at s equals four with a radius of uh, four as well. Notice this ratio between uh, vertical and horizontal axis is not one to one. So that's why it's not a perfect circle in this plot. And we can also uh, ask uh, where is the flat space pole uh, on this plot? It happens so that uh, when we put these dots by hand, not by computation, uh, we see that the flat space pole at s equals mu square always sits on the boundary, or more, more precisely, the tip of these divergent regions. So it tells us that um, the divergences uh, actually comes from the single trace block of the exchange within diagram. This is a bit compact, so let me explain. Suppose you decompose this exchange within diagram in S channel. It will consist of a single trace block with scaling dimension delta B plus infinite sum of double trace blocks. And since delta b is related, closely related to mu, you can see that uh, the divergence is, is actually uh, closely related to this single trace block in the Witten diagram uh, conform block expansion. It also suggests that, that uh, the starting point of the divergences on this complex S-plane is actually controlled by uh, the OPE spectrum. Another thing I should say is that as we have observed here, if you increase the ratio between mu and m from 0 0.5 to 
you see the divergence region shrinks. And when mu over m equal, uh, equals two, uh, this region of divergence shrinks to zero. For mu greater than two, then there's no divergences. So next thing we want to understand is uh, what's the origin of these divergences? Where does it come from? So it, it turns out that the, at the predictive level, there's a good explanation of this picture. It's that if you take the Witten diagram, well, if you take the bulk, bulk propagator of the Witten diagram and then take the fast space limits, you can find two answers depending on how you take the limit. If you keep uh, distance between X and Y close to each other, then you find the usual Feynman diagram because it's concentrated near the center of ADS. But if you keep the distance uh, between X and Y comparable to curvature radius R, then you will find an exponential factor like e to the minus delta b times the geodesic distance between x and y. If you apply this uh, observation to, for example, a triangle Witten diagram, uh, you can find uh, several results. Two of them is our, uh, the usual Feynman diagram centered at the center of ADS and a diagram with all the block points far away separated from each other. And this contribution is denoted as ADS, lambda diagram, in our paper uh, for some reasons uh, that's not clear here. But if you analyze uh, this diagram, you can distill a uh, almost perfect analogous uh, analog analogy to the usual lambda diagram of that space. So that's why we call them ADS lambda diagrams. To be more precise, these diagrams that we call ADS lambda diagrams are just Witten diagrams with the bulk bulk propagator replaced by the exponential factor that we found. And then we put the ball points uh, on the other point because we still need to do the full integral to get the Witten diagram. And our conjecture uh, will work when Feynman diagrams dominate over these ADS lineal diagrams in the flat space limit. There are also cases where uh, the ADS lineal diagrams are just absent and then uh, our prescription will also work. Here is just to illustrate that in addition to the usual scattering picture where it corresponds to a uh, scattering process happening at the center of ABS, which becomes a Feynman diagram in the flat space limit, there can be another contribution where the incoming particles are first connected by a geodesic and then propagate over a long distance and then meet uh, the other two. So these divergences are obstructions to our flat space limit prescription and we need to find a way to deal with them. It turns out there is a simple way to remove the divergences. It comes from the observation that when we calculate flat space limit of written diagrams, uh, one is not allowed to exchange the limit and integral because the integral does not um, converge uniformly. A more intuitive way to understand this is lump of mass dialed into infinity picture. If you focus on the radial direction of ADS space, the Feynman diagram's uh, contribution uh, localized uh, near the center of ADS. Here I'm thinking about an integral uh, for the Witten diagram. Uh, so the center near the center of ADS, which is expected because they correspond to the flat space result. If you zoom into the center of ADS very closely, you should expect to find the flat space results. The other contribution coming from the ads lanau diagram is like a bump that whose center is uh, proportional to scan dimension delta. So if you first send delta to infinity, uh, this bump slides to off to infinity. And after that, if you do the integral, you will only find a contribution from the Feynman diagram. But if you do it in the proper way, you first do the integral and then send delta to infinity, then you will capture both uh, contributions. Depending on the magnitude of the ads lanau diagram, this can or cannot uh, spoil the flat space limit. So in a sense, if we do the integral in the naive way by permuting integral and limit, we get the desired answer. The non-trivial step uh, is to retain nice properties of the original conformal correlator. Because in the end, we want to have a non productive formulation to say and notice about uh, the full correlate. So uh, in the last part, I will try to formulate the prescription uh, in a non-perturbative way, non-perturbative way. 
And for this, there are two main challenges that we need to overcome. The first is that recall we want to extract the scattering amplitude, namely we want to subtract out the disconnected part of the correlator from my full conformal correlator. And a straightforward subtraction will destroy the positivity of uh, given by unitarity. Because if you take a unitary CFT correlator and you subtract from it um, the generalized free part, the, dis the disconnected correlator, and do a conformal block decomposition, now the OP coefficients uh, of your conformal blocks are not a positive definite anymore because you have a bunch of double trace blocks with uh, ne negative coefficients. And that's a problem for us. And second, we want to avoid uh, the divergences coming from ads diagrams in all uh, ST and U channels. So as we have seen, fixing one channel is easy, but if you want to deal with all channels, namely to deal with a cross symmetric uh, scattering amplitude, uh, this is more tricky. So to be precise and for simplicity, the object we are going to consider is a four-point function of scalar fields, identical scalar field, and we denote it by G up to some kinematic prefactor. The two uh, assumptions we are going to make uh, for this question are the following. The first is that uh, in the OP spec spec uh, spectrum between phi and phi, uh, apart from the identity operator, all the scaling dimensions are greater than square root of two times delta phi. Recall that uh, from the example of the scale exchange diagram, we can see that the OP scratch from controls the region of divergences uh, on the Mendelssohn plane. So with this assumption, we are essentially trying to address uh, the divergences of uh, ADS diagrams in at least one channel to tell it, uh, to say that the divergences uh, cannot be anywhere. It has a bounded region. And the second assumption that we had to make is that the flat space limit exists uh, in a small region in the Mendelstam plane, which is denoted by E prime. And that's both S, T, and U are between zero and two. To be more precise, um, this dashed triangle is what is where we assume that our flat space limit exists. And it's compatible with the ads Lana diagram divergences because the divergences are only allowed to appear starting from S equals two and go to higher or t from two to higher, or u from two to higher. So with these two assumptions, the main tool we are, we are going to use is the so-called conformal dispersion relation. It's very similar to a usual dispersion relation for scattering amplitudes. Instead of writing a discontinuity of your scattering amplitude, we use a double discontinuity of our conformal correlation function. And then we integrate around some kernel to reconstruct the full correlator. The main difference is that the double discontinuity has a nice property that it kills uh, conformal blocks in the cross channel. In particular, we'll use it to kill uh, the T channel and U channel identity operator. Because you see uh, on the left hand side, this is the full correlator we want to reconstruct, which is the connected part of the correlator. It's G minus G uh, generalized free field. And it consists uh, both ST and U uh, identity operators. So a priori on the right-hand side, we should write down the same thing. But because of this nice property, uh, we don't need to subtract uh, D channel and U channel identity anymore. And now, the nice thing of it is that uh, in this, uh, if you do a external conformal block decomposition of this object, uh, we can have a positive definite OP coefficients. So, so that's the main advantage of this uh, dispersion relation. It helps us to retain positivity even for the connected conformal correlate. The final result of this uh, approach is that we can write down a subtracted dispersion relation in Mendelssohn S variable for a fixed value of u between zero and two m squared. And this is within the region of 
uh, E prime that we assumed that the flat space limit exists. So then uh, with this dispersion relation, uh, first, at first we can assume, uh, we can consider S1 and S2 are both between zero and two, which lies in the E prime where we assume the limit exists. And then we have this dispersion relation. Now with this formula, it's very uh, straightforward to extend, for example, S1 to the entire complex S plane, because the dependence on the right hand side on S uh, on the F on the right hand side, the dependence on S1 is very simple, and then you can easily bound um, the modulus of this kernel uh, for actually complex S. Having this dispersion so could, so could you please remind what is S1 and S2? S1 and S2 are just the minus and variables. So T is uh, what will become the scattering amplitude in the fast space limit. And uh, we are taking two points, S1 and S2, that live in uh, this E prime region. We pick up to two points as long as they uh, live in the same region. And by assumption, the flat space limit exists uh, within E prime. So uh, by taking the difference of them, and and up to some denominator, we can get a nice kernel on the right hand side that is uh, positive definite. Here, rho L of mu is the spectral density. It's basically a delta function uh, of mu minus the OP spectrum times the OP coefficient. And because we have started from a positive a definite uh, OP coefficients thanks to the conformal dispersion relation, uh, this spectral density rho L of mu is also positive definite. And it's this positivity that, that allows us to extend uh, the existence of this expression to the complex S1 plane, for example. And S2, you can keep it fixed uh, and between zero and two. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another thing, uh, yes. Uh, another thing that we found is that this spectral density, which is uh, basically equivalent to the discontinuity of the scattering amplitude, uh, in our case, it's positive definite uh, starting from uh, mu square equals two rather than mu square equals four. So the positivity of mu square between two and four m square is denoted as the extended unitarity. Whereas starting from 4m square from the physical region, uh, it's called the usual unitarity. And this extended unitarity, as far as we know, uh, has never been rigorously proved before. So we consider this as a nice uh, new result of our approach. And finally, let me briefly explain how we can show unitarity from the CFT side. So first we recall that uh, the usual partial wave coefficient in S matrix is defined or obtained by projecting the scattering amplitude into a certain spin. This is done by integrating again some uh, Gegenbauer polynomial along the scattering angles. And then in the partial wave, in terms of the partial wave coefficients, the unitarity condition says that uh, one plus this coefficient up to some prefactor in modulus is bounded by one. So to prove unitarity from the CFT side, what we do is to replace the scattering amplitude by a conformal curvature divided by the contact diagram, because this is basically what will become a scattering amplitude. Uh, there are many uh, technical subtleties here that's hidden in the asterisk, and I can explain if you are interested later on. But let me first explain the main idea. So uh, by replacing T with this uh, ratio of conformal correlators, we can define a hyperbolic partial wave that is uh, analogous to FL of S. And then we can combine with CFT, CFT unitarity, which uh, in, this, uh, in this case, it means that the conformal correlator on the secondary sheets, recall that to go to the S physical region, we need to go to the secondary sheet from, for our conformal correlator, which should rotate rho around zero by two pi. That's what I mean by secondary sheet. In modulus, uh, this correlator is bounded by the same correlator on the first sheet. 
And then on the first sheets, when you take the fast space limit, it turns out that the connected part of the conformal correlator goes to zero. So this inequality from the CFD side has a one-to-one -one correspondence to the usual uh, um, unitarity inequality in the fast space. Here, I, I'm being very schematic. I, here, I, we need to project to a specific spin as uh, is suggested here. And then after that, you can see that the disconnected part, which I denoted by GFF, corresponds to one uh, above. And then the connected part uh, gives contribution to the FL of S. And then we can show unitarity uh, in the first space from the unitarity, from the unitarity in CFT. So to conclude, um, or to summarize, uh, I have given two prescriptions to extract S matrix and scattered amplitude from conformal correlators. And I've also explained how to do the uh, analytic continuation and what does this correspond to pictorially in a sandwiched uh, picture of Euclidean Lorenzian and Euclidean ADS space. I also introduced the so-called conformal Mendelstam uh, variables, which are identified with the usual Mendelstam variables in the fast space limit. I also uh, show the ads Lenau diagrams, which causes problem to our prescription, but we have found a way to deal with it. And finally, we uh, have a non-perturbative establishment of analyticity and unitarity in the S matrix, starting from CFT correlators. And with this table, uh, uh, I will stop and thank you for the attention. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Can you probably comment on uh, infrared issues? I mean, massless uh, particles in flat space, and some people say that uh, going to ADS may regularize them. Sorry, can you say going to ADS uh, is? Uh, may regularize infrared uh, problems in flat ah. space. Yes. Um, personally, I don't think ADS space is that helpful if you want to go back to flat space. The regulator is there. And when you have some finite curvature radius r. And I think in the strict limits where r is, in the strict limit where r is infinite, uh, the regulator just disappears. Uh, but I don't, I haven't done any uh, precise com com computation for the massless case. So um, we don't have more to say. For us, it's like, there are many uh, expanding directions we can take. For example, massless particles or spinning particles or, or even gauge theory. There are many interesting questions to answer. But for us, we want to, the priority we have is to stay with the simplest setup and to see how much we can go uh, along, along the analyticity scheme. For example, can we show the maximal analyticity starting from the CFT uh, analyticity? For that, we only need scalars uh, of the lightest particles. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions? Maybe you could explain uh, what exactly you get. Uh, so when you, you said that uh, when you compute exchange and you take the flat space limit, you have uh, like some circle uh, where it diverges. Well, what do you get in practice? What is that function which is divergent in the finite region? Oh, sorry, I already passed it. Is it like a sum of um, two there are many... Sorry, what is my... Uh, it's here, yes. Um, there are different ways to see the um, origin of this divergences. So um, if you do it in position space, uh, the simplest way to see it is to replace this bulk to bulk propagator by the so-called spectral representation. 
you rewrite your bulk to bulk propagator by a spectral integral uh, along the imagined axis, uh, let's say a parameter nu with some kernel x like one over nu square minus h square, something like that, which has pole in nu, and then times a product of two bulk to boundary propagator. And you integrate over the boundary point. So if you focus on the integral on nu, uh, you can use a set of point approximation for it. It turns out that uh, when you deform your original contour to the one to the steepest descent one going through the saddle point, you may pick up the pole of your uh, spectral variable kernel. And it's this pole that you picked up corresponds to uh, the divergences we are seeing here. Whereas the saddle point you pick up uh, gives you the Feynman diagram uh, contribution. And um, you can also do this in mailing space. You can start from a, a mailing representation of this exchange diagram, where you have a mailing amplitude times a bunch of gamma functions. And the mailing amplitude is a meromorphic function of uh, a bunch of poles with equal size distance in your gamma one, two plane, for example. And then if you integrate over your gamma one, two, which again, start from some minus i infinity to i infinity, you pick up, you deform it to the saddle point, you pick up some poles. And these poles you picked up are the ones from the mali amplitude. And, and these poles, uh, if you sum all of them up, gives you back to the single trace block. So uh, it's the same picture that the poles that you pick up when deforming the contour uh, give you the ads Lano diagrams or divergences. Whereas uh, the usual saddle point, which is the night part, uh, corresponds to Feynman diagram. Uh, I'm not sure that answers your question. Uh, partially, but let's say, why wouldn't you just take uh, uh, the area of this S Mandelstam, uh, uh, yeah, Mandelstam complex plane and just analytically extend it from the, from the area where it's finite? Isn't that uh, like an easy, an easy way to remove the divergence? Yes. I agree with you. You're saying that we can first uh, pick S where, let's say around here, where we know there's no divergences. We take yeah. the limit, we find a perfect analytic function, and then we can uh, and then we continue back to this region to see the pole. Yeah, I agree with you. That's another way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, oh, okay, so like continuation of this question. So looking at this picture, it's a bit strange. It seems like um, yeah, it seems like uh, for some values of mu, some diagrams just do not contribute, and for other values, uh, it's not. Um, they do not contribute. It's just they are not divergent. Yeah. So you said that you, yeah. So for each uh, value of m at each point of s, you have contributions from both types of diagrams. From those which you said, uh, I don't remember how you call them, Landau diagrams and other types of diagrams, right? Yes, yes. Maybe I can uh, add one comment. I only talk about this dark shaded region in the middle, but there's a light uh, shaded region in the background. Uh, these regions correspond to the region where you will pick up the pole, namely the ADS and other diagram but they are not necessarily larger than the Feynman diagram. So in this white region, uh, you do not have the contribution from the ADS diagram at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. That's just because different kinematics uh, tells you where to where your saddle point sits and then to deform to that saddle point, you, you may not cross any pole and then you don't have the extra contribution. So just removing this, these Landau diagrams is not the right prescription because it also gives a finite contribution to at other points, right? Which you need to include. Or is that... uh, no, they, they, they are either infinity or zero compared to the Feynman diagram. Ah, okay, I see. So either infinity... The simplest uh, toy model is like one over x in modulus to the power of delta. 
Mm. And then when x modulus is greater than one, you get zero. Mm -hmm. I see, okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? I have a question, um, which is a bit abstract. So suppose we relax unitarity condition, perturbative unitarity. So consider ADS uh, and put there some high derivative theory, so a scalar theory with massless and massive ghosts, for example. And then uh, there are some speculations that maybe non-perturbatively this theory may become kind of unitary, maybe at the expense of some causality viola violation, etc. So there could be some non perturbative effects which affect the uh, perturbative spectrum where you have a ghost. So the question one may ask whether the non perturbative approach like what you're using can sh could shed light on that kind of questions where one could try to relax some assumptions like unitarity and uh, perturbative unitarity and still recover something non perturbative Do you think this is in principle possible or it's unlikely that makes sense because you are assuming CFT corresponds to, at least perturbative should be, it should be unitary theory, right? So in ADS. Yes, yes. But yeah, yeah I'm, um, just, I'm just asking this question because this is something which uh, people are discussing, but uh, it's very hard to settle just using the term. Uh, um, first of all, I'm not familiar with the background of this question, but uh, I still can see that by giving up unitarity on the CFD side, uh, we don't have much to say. I think it's, it's it will be very difficult to uh, give up unitarity because it's unitarity that gives us the positivity in, let's say, your conformal block decomposition. And this positivity is crucial in putting bounds uh, uh, on the complex S plane. So, so once you give up unitarity, um, I don't think we can say anything about anapacity uh, for the flat space amplitude from the correlator side, from the CFT side. But um, I'm not saying it's not entirely possible because there are also techniques developing in the CFT side to address non-unitary uh, uh, correlators. But I'm not familiar with the development uh, in the most recent uh, time, so I don't have anything to say. Yeah, you can, for example, consider some logarithmic CFTs, whatever. Yeah, you can. Um, well, anyway, yeah, this is a little bit of the main topic. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, this is interesting, but uh, to me, from what I know, it sounds very difficult to to uh, give up unitarity this setup. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask another thing about LSZ. So do you understand what's going on with uh, Witten diagrams, which have uh, loops on external lines? Because this is the thing which LSZ is for, right? To, to remove this kind of divergences. Uh, you're adding loops to the external propagators? Yes, to bulk to boundary, to external lines. Uh, you're asking what? If I take such a Witten diagram with loops on the external propagator and then take the fast space limits, is that yeah, what you're yeah. asking? Yeah, do you get infinity or you just ignore these diagrams? Well, in principle, if you just care about CFT result, which somehow like don't care about uh, Witten diagrams, perturbative computations whatsoever, you just take the complete CFT result, then it, probably it's irrelevant. But in principle, if you are interested to compute that from uh, from the ADS side, I think you should know what to do with uh, such diagrams. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I don't have, I haven't done this computation, but if you are talking about external legs, uh, I have something to say still. Um, well, 
you can imagine putting arbitrary number of loops on the external leg such that the whole thing uh, add up together gives you a propagator with the on shell mass, uh, the physical mass. You mean and then, it gets shifted? The, like, uh... Yeah, it gets shifted. It gets, if you want, renormalized. Mm -hmm. you, you sum up all the loops. But for us, this is done by simply uh, sending the bulk to bulk propagator to the boundary. This is equivalent to putting it on shell. Um, I, I don't think it's completely equivalent, but it's somewhat analogous. Because you see the scaling dimension delta here that we have is the on shell mass. So we are kind of uh, doing this renormalization procedure by uh, sending the bulk, bulk propagator with one bulk point to the boundary and then multiply by this exponential factor to make it finite, also putting the mass on shell as the physical mass. So it's a very, uh, if you want a simple manipulation. And this holds off for all kinds of uh, non-productive correlators. Okay, so you suggest to first start from a bulk to bulk propagator with loops on it, and, and only then send uh, one of the points to the boundary, right? right? I'm saying I'm suggesting don't add any loops, and all those loops, uh, adding all those loops and sum up, renormalize is equivalent in our setup, equivalent to sending only the bulk bulk propagator one point to boundary and then multiply by this uh, compensating factor. Um, no, I'm just trying because... to compare this with flat space in which uh, you can consider two point function with loops that you can sum up uh, what's called schwinger dyson equation or something. Mass gets shifted, right? And then you get a different value of mass. I would expect some sort of yes. part here as well. Uh, can, now you can consider a, a two-point function on the boundary. From the CFD side, the two-point function uh, can be obtained by taking a single uh, bulk-to-bulk propagator, and you send both points to the boundary, and then you renormalize in the sense that you multiply by this exponential, exponential factor. And you get the full number of a two-point function without doing any loops. Yeah, so there is assumption here that you have exact dimension on CFT side, you know, exact dimension. Yes. Yes. Respond to exact mass. So you're not uh, analyzing details of that somehow. You're not computing the perturbative somehow. You're just making uh, this itself. Yes, that's a better way to say it, I think. Yeah, OK, thank you. Are there any more questions? Okay, if there are no further questions, then uh, thank you very much for a nice talk. Thank you. Thank you very much.